is joining us tonight with Graham Assist. Yeah, this, I mean, this is the last book that he and I worked on extensively together. Um, and, uh, you know, in that way, and, and it's, it's definitely like bittersweet to finish it, but uh, I think it came out fantastically. I think it came out fantastically, too. I said to Graham, we had a little celebratory drink a moment ago, which is why we're slightly late starting this, but tough, um, that I think Clive really would be proud of this book and enjoy it. Um, I certainly did, and as you know, if you've watched Cosmere events at the Poison Pen, we've been doing them for almost 30 years, so I've read a lot of Cosmere's, and I really love this one. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I think Clive would have loved it, too. And, um, you know, if we wanted to celebrate in true Custler style, we'd be having a drink right now. But uh, I guess we can't do that on camera. No, but we we could, except we <laughs> forgot to get any. But we just had a little drink beforehand, and so here we are. Um, so a little backstory. Graham wrote two books, Black Rain and Black Sun, for Bantam umpteen years ago. Must have been, Lord, what was it, 20 years ago? Maybe more? Uh, no, not quite that far. I'm not that old yet. No, but I, it was a long time ago, long enough ago that one of my characters uh, was, was at some point looking for a floppy disk. So it was a while back. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so I read them both, and I really enjoyed them. And at that moment, I knew that Clive was looking for someone to co-author uh, the Numa Files books. And so... I gathered up Graham's two books and marched over to Clive's house and presented them to him and said, this is the guy. And Clive read them and, um, and apparently agreed um, because he signed Graham up. And if, I'm not sure, are, your, are those two books available in ebook still? I'm not sure if they're available in print. Yep, the Black Rain and Black Sun are both available in ebook. Uh, you can, I think you can get them printed uh, might be print on demand. I'm not sure, but you can get them. You can get them. And uh, then there's a third book in the series. Um, it's called the Eden Prophecy. So there's three books in that series. Maybe more someday. We'll see. Well, they're a lot of fun. So I really recommend if you are looking for more adventure reading that you pick up copies, and then you can see why I was so excited. Um, there was a, it was a very good fit. Uh, the Numa Files. I'm trying to remember. I think the first book that Clive wrote with a collaborator, although I might be wrong, was Dirk. But maybe it was Paul Comprecos with an early Numa file. Do you remember? You know, uh, Paul and I have uh, become good friends, uh, which, uh, you know, has uh, been fantastic for me because I picked up from where he left off uh, on the Numa files. And I'm a, I've been able to pick his brain and talk to him about different things. And uh, I believe he was the first one to do collaboration and... Uh, he, tell, he tells a great story uh, about how, you know, he was working on this thing and, and, and one day Clive just said, well, we need to do more work on it. And he just said, come on out here and we're going to talk about it. <laughs> and uh, I think that's how the whole meeting up with Clive and working on the outlines really, really came about was him and Paul. I can believe that. Paul wrote three or four books set um, back in, what's it, Cape Cod or somewhere. I mean, it was really hazy. But I remember my mother liked them a lot, and there was, there was a maritime or diver thing to them. Uh, so I guess he seemed like a natural for Numa Files. Now, tell us, for anyone who's watching this who doesn't know it, and there may not be anyone who doesn't know this already, what does Numa stand for? Well, you can put me on the spot, because I've, I've actually sadly gotten this uh wrong before uh it's the national underwater and marine agency well uh, done that yeah. is it yeah yeah when, once upon <laughs> in, when somewhere once upon a time i i said i said maritime agency and i i was uh immediately pelted with tomatoes and uh that heckled off the stage. Right. So. And the, the wonderful part is, and one of the reasons I love Clive so much was that he often translated what was in his fiction to real life and sometimes vice versa. So Clive actually created um, a version of NUMA um, in real life, a charity that, uh, or I'm not sure if I'd call it a charity exactly, but anyway, an agency that was devoted to um, looking for shipwrecks and other things. And he spent a lot of time uh, particularly in Whitby, looking for the at the end the um, possible remains of uh, John Paul Jones' ship, the Bonhomme Richard, but he also 
worked to bring up the Huntley, the Confederate submarine. So, you know, in real life, he wasn't all that different, really, from Dirk Pitt and Kurt Austin, the pneumophile guy. Uh, yeah, no, Cl- Clive really was the guy that you see when you read, especially Dirk Pitt's character. Um, I was at a great event with Clive and his son, Dirk, where they were they were talking about one of the Dirk Pitt books, and it was, it was a question and answer session, and, and somebody... Uh, Somebody asked Dirk, he said, so is Dirk Pitt based on you? And, and Dirk pointed over to his dad, he said, that's the real Dirk Pitt over there. And he was pointing at Clive. And, and I think everybody who knows him knows that. He started his own organization. I think, I guess it would be a nonprofit, not really charity. But um, uh, but I think he would, uh, you know, uh, he, he would do the same kind of things in real life to the extent that the characters would do them in the in the book. And he's definitely found a lot of historical ships and he's found them with in uh style you know and 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 dealt with you know controversy and and people trying to go after them for saying you know you know you guys shouldn't have been able to do this or you guys uh we found it first and he's he's gone through all of these things you know dealing with villains in real life the way dirk kind of dealt with them in the books um and prevailed in all most all the cases and funny thing was I remember when he was talking about going out again to look for uh, the Bonham Richard and and I said when are you guys gonna go he's like I'm not sure uh, but we might go and I was like you know this would be something I really really think would be cool for me to maybe I could join you and he said well you know we're gonna be a bunch of guys on a little ship going back and forth in a storm-tossed ocean in the North Sea or wherever uh, for like three or four days and I was just like yeah, send me a postcard. Because <laughs> it didn't sound... It, it, you had to have a special kind of love of adventure to, to go out there and do that. And that was that's basically who Clive was. I love it. I'm sorry, Patrick. I seem to have lost the... That's okay. Sorry about that. The Welcome, background, mobile user. Right. Disappeared. So maybe Patrick can sneak around behind me and fix it. Yeah. We will see. Um, I'm losing my thread. Where, where were we? Oh, anyway. Um, Clive did a, a lot of traveling. He loved to travel. And... Um, I too have done a great deal of it in um, many of the places I've gone, for example, the Northwest Passage Crew in 2017, the first one that went from Alaska to Greenland, um, there were experts on the ship and several of them knew Clive, you know, they'd worked with him or they knew about him. There's one guy from Seattle, I can't remember what all, but I mean, he was very well known among actual scientists and explorers, not just in the literary world. And um, as often happens when you reach a great age, such as mine, and such as Clive. Well, Clive was nine years older than I, so I try to keep that in mind. Um, is that you get a lot of awards from people who are delighted that you live so long, but at the <laughs> same time, they also recognize that you've got, you know, decades of achievement. And so he did spend quite a lot of his last years um, just collecting awards, going to places, making speeches, you know, that kind of thing, which he loved. So it was great. Let's talk about Fast Ice. Um, great title, by the way, for this book. And I like Thank the you. cover. And I say that because much of this book, or at least beginning any, well, much of the book takes place in Antarctica. So, Graham, I feel like you did a real deep dive into um, not only Antarctica, where I have been, but I'm not sure you have been. Uh, I have not. I have not been that far south. In fact, much like what we were just talking about various places we were going to go before coronavirus hit and I had plans after we were finishing this book to go down there do a tour take a lot of pictures create sort of a tie-in thing like these are the these are similar areas to the locations that that show up in the book and obviously that got put on hold and uh, it's clearly not gonna happen before the book comes out because here we are um, but Fortunately, we live in the day of uh, the internet, and you can do massive amounts of research without ever leaving your comfortable chair in your nice, nicely heated home. And uh, you can look at videos, you know, pictures, maps, read descriptions, you know, follow people on YouTube who are down there, and you can get a you can get a decent sense of of the area that you are uh, researching. And and so that's kind of that's that that. That's the research I did. I was not on location. (laughs) No. Well, I can say, because I have been there, that um, Graham got the big distinctions between Antarctica and the Arctic right. 
Uh, for one thing, the color of the ice is different in Antarctica, right? Because, yeah. well, you tell it. Well, well, I mean, a, a lot of the the sea ice is 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 formed, uh, you know, frozen frozen. The water on the ocean is freezing, but the ice that comes through the glaciers and comes down to the sea and breaks off in these massive sheets is is really pure pure fresh water without any uh you know i don't even, any contaminants in it and it tends to be this different color this really bright translucent blue once the snow and the frost is is off of it so um you know that was it's one of the things that i learned and i wanted to put in the book so i'm glad i'm glad to hear i got it right you did get it right <laughs> another thing which may seem strange to you is the shape of the of the icebergs the big ice in the arctic and antarctica are quite different in the arctic they are much more vertical they're much more jagged i mean i've sailed around Mountainous. lots of icebergs and all but in antarctica they're flat they're really like mesas if, you know if you've been to new mexico and seen all the table mesas and all you get these enormous floating icebergs that are flat um and quite different um what would you say the size of some of them is Graham? Well, you know, they the the recently an iceberg that broke off just was in the news a few days ago that I believe is the size of Los Angeles. I've seen ones that they're tracking that are the size of Rhode Island, the size of Connecticut. Um, these are huge, huge, basically floating masses that if usually what happens is they get caught in the current, moved a little ways, and then they ground themselves and they're kind of they don't go very far. But um, at one point in the planning of this book, we were talking about some of these icebergs, and, and, and the, I'm probably not giving much away to, he, to tell you that the main characters are going to end up on some of these icebergs at some point, and Clive and I were, were discussing, you know, what needed to happen there, and, and we kept saying, well, how big should it be? Should it, should it be the size of a ship? Should it be a mile across? Should it be two miles across? And, you know, Clive's one who was always bigger is better, and he said, "Let's just make it the size of a city." <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was a plot point that I don't believe we ended up doing, but it was uh, it was an idea at one point. Um, but they they can be yeah, they can be huge. Well, they are huge, and certainly another thing is there is a difference in the animal life. There are no penguins naturally in the Arctic, and there are no polar bears naturally in Antarctica, and this is important because one of the one of the important uh, characters, if you will, in fast ice are microbes, but paleo microbes, microbes that have been buried under ice for millennia. And because the ice is thawing, they are releasing. You have a very interesting bit in the book, um, I think it is in the afterword, about um, reindeer in Siberia that kind of illustrate the point. What happened with them? So, you know, one of the things we try to do when we're writing these books is kind of get as much reality into the fiction as possible. Um, and part of the story in this in this book is is related to a microbe that is doing something nobody's ever seen before. Um, so to find out whether we were just creating complete fiction there or actually, you know, hewing close to the truth, we did a lot of research. And one of the interesting things that has uh and quite scary things to be completely honest with you that we've s sort of discovered recently is microbes that the human race has never seen or or uh you know have been hidden from um the surface of the world uh, are down in some of these lakes beneath the glaciers they're down in some of these uh um basically places that have been cut off by thousands of feet of ice and if you drill down to it and find them and bring them up you're exposing them to a world that has never seen them and that they have never seen because it's been down there for 50,000 100,000 years you know uh, and the, the modern world has never experienced them dealt with them our immune systems haven't dealt with them um, but a smaller uh, shorter time frame version of that is something that's happening in uh, northern climates in places like Siberia there's what they call the permafrost. And permafrost is basically ice, iced land that is just now frozen solid and is supposed to stay frozen solid forever. Hence the name permafrost. Um, but in our modern world, a lot of that permafrost is starting to melt. And there are things in the permafrost that died and fell in there when it was liquid, you know, a thousand, two thousand years ago. And 
There's a, there's a fairly famous case where a reindeer that had been in the ice for over a thousand years thawed out, and these villagers found it, and they, I guess, they did something with it. They maybe brought it back, or they just investigated it, and they all came down with anthrax because there are anthrax microbes in this dead reindeer from uh, from a thousand years ago. That even though it's been frozen for a thousand years, they were still they were still live. I think it's anthrax. It might have been smallpox. Either way, it wasn't good. No, it wasn't good. In fact, I don't remember for sure whether this has actually happened or it's been in fiction that I have read, but in opening so-called plague pits, um, it's a oh, the bubonic plague or whatever can be re-released because these, these microbes or viruses are incredibly hardy. They either go dormant or I don't know what they do, but anyway... They can survive. It's also been discussed um, that the deforestation of the Amazon may very well be releasing viruses or other things into the air that we have not had to cope with. So this is a little unnerving, certainly in the in the time of COVID, to be reading about this. But they are a very important part of um, of the plot of your book. Is that there is a search going on for um, well, there's paleo microbiology going on. There is. There is, and it's a lot more exciting than it sounds. In fact, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it's it's not a classroom. In fact, what we've talked about today is probably about as much as goes into the book. But it's it's a fascinating thing because um, in the book, basically, there's someone who wants to make a great change to the world, and they believe they found uh, the key to do it by unearthing one of these microbes. Um, I don't want to give too much no. away. But, you know, if you could bring something back to the surface of the world that the, the world really hasn't seen for thousands of years or 10,000 years or since the last ice age, you might be able to, uh, you know, change the, change the course of uh, our, our future events here. So that's kind of what, what the story centers on. Well, there's certainly um, global warming, climate change is, is another a real force that is going on. Um, I thought it was an extremely interesting plot and and more reality based than you might imagine some of the cuzzlers have been fantastical shall we say they've been rooted in fiction and so forth but the odds that some of it would really happen have been pretty low but in this case i can really imagine that what you're writing about could come true i appreciate that and it is kind of scary in, in its own way um yeah i think the closer you get to the truth the closer you get to reality in fiction, you definitely start seeing, you know, you, you definitely start seeing things that you you kind of, you can kind of scare yourself as you as you're working on things as you're doing research. And as I was learning about these things, uh, there there's there are viruses that they've uncovered in under glaciers all around the world, and they've brought them up and they're testing them in labs to see what they do. And I don't know about you guys, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> I say leave them where they are. But um, but what if they're going to surface anyway due to well, due well, to warming? So yeah, that's, there we are. You know, this whole thing is really if you go back and read Michael Crichton's first published book is Michael Crichton because he did read, he wrote his original book, which ironically won the Edgar under his under. I'm trying to remember if it was a pseudonym. I think it was called Hudson, wasn't it? Jeffrey Hudson or something, because he was a doctor and he, he if the book flopped, he didn't want to be embarrassed <laughs> or whatever it is. So he, he did, and it turned out, as I say, that it won the Edgar. But anyways, Michael Crichton, his first book, I think, was it called The Andromeda Strain. Mm -hmm. Do I have that right? And it was basically about an expedition that went to the moon and brought back a virus or microbes from the moon. Uh, and what that would do. And I think that certainly is something you have to think about with interplanetary travel. You know, they're not going to bring back um, Percy from Mars. I mean, I think he's going to stay there. But, um, <laughs> but um, and maybe in some way that's a safety precaution. I'm well, so blown away by that. The thought that he's actually 11 minutes is all it takes to send a signal to Percy from Mars. I mean, from here to Mars. 11 minutes i just i'm so if it's like star trek all over again or well it's it's one of those things that it seems it's amazing to me also but the funny thing is so i wrote a self-published book that is a, it deals with interplanetary travel and a battle for uh whether the people on earth were going to get to go to mars or not it's it, it's called the gods of war 
And in it, I have, there's a point where they're, they're having a conversation back and forth. And I suddenly realize, I'm like, you can't do this. They can't have a phone call back and forth because I could say something to you and I gotta wait 11 minutes for you to get it and 11 more minutes for the signal to come back. It would be a really, really slow conversation. So I get what you're saying. I also find it hard to fathom that things moving speed of light take that long to get anywhere. And so it's definitely, you know, it's, we live in an age where we're kind of reaching, I think, new limits on what we can do and also discarding old limits. Okay, we are live again. Well, hi, sorry. Um, apparently we had a little technical glitch there and got booted off Facebook and now we're back. And I don't remember, obviously, I would, rather I don't know at what point you lost us, but we could go back and talk about Finland just in case that <laughs> part <laughs> left because that was sort of fun. So, Graham, we were, we were talking about the fact that NUMA has apparently endless funding, funding. Uh, whether a black ops operation or a legitimate operation, they never seem to go slow on money. And, and Clive pointed out writing fiction that there didn't never needed to be a shortage of money. So Graham sends um, a couple on a mission to Helsinki in the middle of winter. And the, the woman of the couple complains bitterly that in Helsinki in the winter has no real shopping opportunities. And she her price for doing this is that Numa will send her to some place like Paris or Milan when, um, when it's over. And I pointed out to Graham, if I had read this book in time, I would have refuted that because on my trip to Helsinki, not only did I find it a shopping mecca, but I bought my very favorite pace, very favorite pair of Italian loafers, which I treasure to this day. Boo! I know, I see. <laughs> This is the problem with only doing internet research, people. You 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 miss out on details like the best shops in Helsinki. Um, so uh, next time, I'm just gonna have to go everywhere and check out all the stores and. Uh, or just run the book by me first. There you the go. Case, there you go. Anyway, um, I wanted to. We were we were talking about the fact that um, very often um, international thrillers and their protagonists, their heroes, so to speak end up with some kind of an agency as backup. Either, and, and for various reasons, a couple which Jack Carr pointed out to us recently in a different program, is they not only need agency, i.e. some kind of power and legitimacy, um, but they also need information. And it's difficult for like one or two people to acquire the depth of information that um, is required to do a lot of these missions. So. NUMA is what a legitimate government agency. It it's is, not really a black ops thing. They're not top. They're not top secret. They're they're above board. You could find their office. You know they, they they're, but they are uh, well funded and uh, very very. Um, uh, how to put this? They do a wide ranging thing, a, a wide ranging variety of things in their in their daily work. Um, I, Clive and I used to laugh about this. Say, and and they're supposed to be scientists, but they're always they're always battling the rest of the world to save the world, and they have to use science to do it. So they're scientists, they're oceanographers, but they also tend to be, you know, um, very capable people when when it comes right down to it. Well, they have to be in extraordinary physical condition. I mean, you think these were guys that spent two hours a day in the gym uh, for some kind of the, you know, some of the feats that they end up doing. Like I do, obviously. Well, clearly, right. <laughs> um, so one last thing before we open it up to questions is that I think there's some, you expect to have ships, really cool ships in oh, in most coasters, not every coaster. Absolutely, there should be. And if cool not ships. ships, there should be cool cars, or possibly both. Absolutely. But in this case, um, there is a particularly cool, it starts with a ship um, that comes to a sad end. And it's an old ship, and part of the reason it comes to a sad end is that it's an old ship. But towards the end of the book, there's a really cool ship, and we don't want to give away what it is. Spoil but it. No. I wanted to ask you whether that's a real thing or whether it's a thing you made up, because I thought it was fabulous. So no, that the the idea behind the secret vessel in this in this um, novel uh, is is comes from legitimate plans that uh, the U.S. military had once upon a time, and uh, you know there were even. Uh, prototypes 
built of this vessel, and I don't want to give away any more, but no. uh, the, it was, you know, it'd be an interesting thing to see somebody do for real. Uh, and that was one of the things that was great about working on it. You know, Cl Clive loved ships. He loved nautical knowledge. And, you know, you could bring up some obscure thing, like even the, the, the type of vessel that's in this book. And he'd, he'd be like, oh, yeah, let me tell you a story about that. And he would just instantly recall some story he knew that then you'd research and find out, oh, yeah, that is true. So um, usually in almost every book, we're trying to think of, you know, what kind of unique vessel can I bring into this? So it's not just another ship. And uh, I think we did well in this one. So hopefully you, did. you guys will have to tell us. I thought he did really well. And actually, it just reminds me one more thing that is a trademark, Kessler, is there's always some bit of history that is tied to it. In this case, it is a Third Reich expedition to Antarctica. And it's only like, what, three pages or something in the very beginning of the book. Yep. But uh, you have to pay attention to what happens to the Germans who um, have flown down to Antarctica and uh, and remember it as you read your way through the book. So, you know, that's what prologues are for, right? right. Is that's to give correct. you a hint. Yeah, right. Give you a hint and, and get you interested. I mean. So that's the, that's the um, history in it. In and that's, the, and that's a true, uh, you know, that's, true facts from history. It was in, in 1920, or 1939, mm. shortly before World War II started, uh, the Germans sent this unique expedition down to Antarctica, allegedly to look for sources of whale oil, but many people think they were down there scouting to set up a base. And there's, there's photographs of the ships they were on, the, the seaplanes that they carried, the people that were there on the expedition. Um, but the true truth of what actually happened on that expedition is kind of cloudy. So that kind of forms the prologue of the story. Oh, cloudy. How wonderful for you, right? That's right. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. You want cloudy. You don't yeah, want absolutely. Your own right. So, Patrick, before we lose the internet again, whatever hopefully happened. We, hopefully we won't. I'm trying I, to stitch together the questions from both of these. Okay. Questions. So fire away, Dr. Graham. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to hear me. I think they will. I can repeat it if you want. Okay. Yeah, you should. Uh, this is from Kathy, and she says, uh, Graham, number one, do you get to select your audiobook narrator, uh, Scott Brick Rocks? Uh, <laughs> and number two, how much longer do you think Kurt Austin and Joe Zavala will be the lead NUMA action characters? Okay, well, the, the, the first question is, do we get to, do we get to pick our own uh, audiobook narrator with the additional comment that uh, Scott Brick Rocks, which... Unfortunately, is true. He's fantastic, but this is just all going to go to his head if he hears about this. So please keep that quiet. But he he is actually the best uh, of all the narratives I've heard. Um, so no, we don't get to pick our own, but we've got the best guy out there doing it. So if we did get to pick our own, I'm pretty sure we'd pick Scott. Um, what was the second question again? The second question was about uh, how long you think Kurt Austin and Zavala will be the lead. Investigators. Okay, yeah, the second question is about Kurt Austin and Joe Zavala and how long they will be lead NUMA investigators. Um, technically, they work under special projects, which pretty much means they can do anything they want, which is fantastic because that helps them get into all kinds of trouble. Uh, I think they will probably continue on for the, uh, you know, foreseeable future. I would say it will be a long time. I have a good question from Dave uh, from the UK uh, who says, Hi Graham, did you feel you had more freedom or were you nervous about the responsibility of writing this book without as much of uh, Clive's input? Okay, this question comes from Dave in the UK. It's about uh, freedom versus responsibility of finishing this book up uh, after Clive had passed. And uh, first of all, Dave, what are you doing up? It's very, very late or early in the UK. Um, second of all, uh, tremendous responsibility. Uh, you know, uh, is, Clive has always been like both uh, really soft hand and giving us freedom to do what, what we take the book in the directions we thought would be good. And I think that's how the creativity stayed so high. But he's also been very, you know, a very strong presence in you've gone off the rails here let's bring this back in here and do this and do that and and um without clive there uh, it was one of those things where you know 
that safety net uh, is gone, you know. And um, I think what got made it reasonably easy would be the fact that, fortunately, I, I used to live in Arizona and I probably spent 20 or 30, you know, long days working with Clive on various on various books over the past few years and I could hear him as I was writing and every writer's different and and Clive Clive likes a fast pace and he likes a lot of action and he likes a lot of dialogue and he and he and he doesn't want the story to slow down into the character thinking too much and he's he's been very upfront about that in in a million interviews and uh you know I, and I'm a thinker so I like the characters to stop and kind of ponder things, and and uh, I would say in every single book there there have been sec- there have been times when Clive just w- will be talking to me and he'll say, so see this part, these three pages, yep, just cross them out. The character's thinking too much. He needs to get back into the action. And so uh, to some extent, as I'm working on this book, I I could still hear Clive. Uh, I could I could see myself rambling on and being like, mm, I'm pretty sure Clive crossed this out. So. I'm going to do it for him. And uh, thanks, Clive. Taught me a lot. I, point, I pointed out to Graham when we were having a, a drink before our discussion here that there was a, a place for all of that in the author afterward, the afternotes. And um, if there was something he couldn't bear to let go, he could take it out of the story, according to Clive's dictum. <laughs> but he could stick it in um, an afternote in the back for if he didn't want to really let it go. I like that idea. I, like I know that you did. I was really pleased I you told saw, you about you it. You saw the smile on my face, and it wasn't the beer. It was uh, It was a great idea that you had. So you can't have Austin brooding, looking out to sea for very long? He can He can brood and look out to sea. He can, but only for maybe a, a couple of lines. He can't and, spend and really, like two days journaling and being like, why am I so sad? Right, but it's not just that. It's it's no. also um, it's also the the research details. You you wind up you can go overboard, um, not just with you know the interior lives of the characters, but you can throw in too much detail and slow things down as well. And Clive, Clive was always about moving the story. Absolutely. I mean, he really was. He was he had a natural gift for knowing how to just move it along. Absolutely, and we do all go overboard. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> because once you've spent right. days doing research, yeah. you don't want to put one paragraph of that in there. You want to show everybody how much you know, and then you realize you're just slowing the story down. So, back to the author note. We'll discuss that further. Right. Carry on, Patrick. Okay. Uh, yeah. Aaron. Aaron has a few questions. Um, what author or authors did uh, Graham like to read growing up? And then the second question was, uh, Do you have a favorite Cussler book? excluding the ones that you've written. <laughs> okay, so what authors did I listen to, or listen to? We didn't, we didn't have audiobooks back then. Uh, what authors did I read when I was growing up, and do I have a favorite Cussler book not including mine? Um, it's really interesting because one of the first novels, like grown-up novels that I read, actually was Raise the Titanic. And uh, I had remembered seeing this book everywhere at when I was young, too young to read this kind of book, and, and talking to my dad, and I, and I said, Dad, is somebody gonna, I knew what the Titanic was, I said, is somebody gonna raise the Titanic? And he said, no, that's a, that's a fiction novel. But I, I remember seeing him, people on airplanes had it, people in the, you know, people uh, sitting in the, in the lounge had it, it's just uh, people at the hotels, and I was just like, what, what is with this book everywhere? And I remembered that years later and picked it up and read it, it was one of the first full-length novels I read. And, um, I loved it, but at the time, I had zero idea that it was part of a series. You know, I was probably 15 or 16 at the time, and I didn't realize there were series of books, and if you, even if you go read Raise the Titanic today, it actually could perfectly be a standalone book. It doesn't totally depend on Dirk Pitt. It, it, it is a story, it's a huge story that involves Dirk Pitt as the main character, but it's not necessarily a Dirk Pitt story and and then years later when I discovered it was a series I started picking all of them up um, so so Clive is one of the guys obviously which probably makes sense that my style ended up melding well with what he was looking for um, Michael Crichton was huge influence um, gosh a lot of authors who I like I can't remember their names now but I can remember reading their books and just totally being 
blown away. I'm more like the person that goes into a bookstore like this and tends to just wander around and pick up different books left and right, and then something grabs me, uh, I'll read it. And I use some of the times I, you know, uh, it doesn't do well for name recognition, but half the time I, I used to not even think about who the author was. Um, Peter Benchley, I remember reading Jaws and being terrified. Um, you some, could have Tom Clancy, The Hunt for Red October, which is much more technical than, you know, it, Tom Clancy tended to write more technically than Clive did. The first two Tom Clancy books were like touch springs or whatever you call it for me when I was, you know, 18, 19 years old. Yeah. Uh, I thought they were, you know, they were, those were the kind of books that I like read again and again. And I just, I, I loved them. So, yeah, well, a, lo a lot of guys, definitely a lot of people. And of the Custer books that you didn't write. Oh, you're you not going to let me I'm off on that one. I'm not going to let you Come off on. Look on that one. Oh. Well, you can stay with Raise the Titanic I if can, you want. I can, but that's you know that's the that's the easy answer. Mm -hmm. um, Raise the Titanic is definitely uh, one of those touchstone books. I I truly I loved Sahara as well long before it was even a movie. I I, I remember reading it and thinking this could this probably could be a movie. I thought it was a a pretty unique story and I, I even today even when I would be sitting down with Clive and talking about out stories we talk about how different stories came about and one of the unique things about Sahara is even though it's the whole Numa world is there in the background it's really Dirk and, and Al on their own for most of the book and that's a completely different kind of story to we're going back and forth to headquarters we've got all this help coming in we're doing all these different things and um, so I think that's one of the reasons that book stood out. Yeah. You should pick one of Boyd Morrison's books because he's watching. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say I think Marauders, Boyd's last book, his last full collaboration with Clive, in which they rebuilt the Oregon, I think was an amazing book, Boyd. Well done. Yeah, good job, Boyd. That was fantastic. It was a fantastic idea, too. To, it really was. To actually... Two-part idea. Yep. It was. Yep. I remember when uh, Boyd and... Clive had gotten together and, and come up with the idea uh, and I remember when Boyd was telling me about it and I just remember being like damn that's a great idea I'm kind of jealous <laughs> so good job dude that was fantastic um, John has a couple of really nice ones to comment he just says uh, thank you for c continuing to write these stories I cannot tell you how much it is appreciated uh, just getting a lot of thumbs up and hearts from other viewers Fantastic. Um, so Patrick is saying there are a lot of thumbs ups and hearts from other viewers who are happy that Graham and his colleagues are continuing to write in the spirit of class. Yeah. It, it's an honor. It really is an honor. And his question is, are you interested in doing a crossover story with the Fargos or the Oregon File? So, uh, fans of all the series will know that um, Boyd Morrison and I actually did a mini crossover between the Oregon Files and the Numa Files several books ago. And it's really just one chapter. And it was about four or five weeks of absolute hell trying to get the details exactly right. I would write a set, we talked about what we would do. I would write a section, I would send it to him or talk to him about it, he'd say, no, 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 this is happening and this is happening and this is happening. And then he would write a section and send it over to me like, no, they can't do this because this happened and this happened and this happened. And it was an excruciating amount of work for one chapter. <laughs> it was awesome, it was fun, um, and I never want to do it again. So uh, probably not a full-blown crossover, at least not for me. Uh, Shane asks, uh, Graham, are you planning on writing any of your solo books again soon? Uh, thanks. Shane has asked if I'm going to write any solo books again soon. And it's funny because I'm always tinkering around with something. And uh, one day, uh, but I don't know. Soon, probably no. Uh, but one day, yeah, uh, absolutely. I have a question for Graham. Is writing a lot more fun than practicing law? Yeah. Uh, Yes, unequivocally, absolutely, 100%, yes. Because I can say that it's a lot more fun to be a bookseller than practicing law, so here we are. <laughs> My take on practicing law is uh, you, you, you get into the office and you argue with your, your boss and your coworkers, and then you go to court and you argue with the judge, and then you come home and you come back to the office and argue with your clients. And I'm just like, when does this get fun? So it, it, I, I definitely find this a lot more interesting. 
Absolutely. But the legal training, I'm sure, has a lot to do with how successful you are writing these kinds of books. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think you learn how to, you know, uh, you learn how to analyze things and break things down and parse things to where, you know, you just look at things differently once you've spent a bunch of time in law school and as an attorney. You you read things differently and you and you tend to kind of word things more precisely because you have to, and I think that actually helps in the writing, absolutely. Um, let's see, you may have talked about this a little bit already, but <clears throat> Mark asks, did you talk to Clive about the plot for this book before he passed? And then the second, uh, second question is, will you continue the series? Okay, so Mark is asking about the plot of Fast Dice and how much Clive and I worked on it. And, and basically, these books are, are kind of written a long time in advance. What you guys don't realize is a lot of times by the time we're talking about this book, we're halfway through the next one, which sometimes means you, get, you ask us questions and it's kind of like, um, I can't really remember because I'm working on a new book right now. So, uh, but Clive and I worked on this extensively. We did the whole plot uh, in a, a multiple step outline. Uh, and, you know, he he and I were probably about halfway through the writing of the book uh, before, unfortunately, we lost him. Um, but the entire story had been plotted out. The characters had been had flushed out. Um, a lot of the twists and turns, the research that we were talking about, the particular kind of ship we use in this, he, he loved all that. He was He was super excited about that. Uh, while we were working on it, and uh, I think it shows in the book, yeah. I'm going to point out, because some of you <clears throat> may not have heard me say this before, that Clive had a, a separate office with a major flo a main floor and a kind of a balcony um, in, in the home that he lived in here in Metro Phoenix, and he loved it there. It was, um, that's where he spent his time um, and I used to go and visit him and we would sit there. He's on one side of his desk and I'm in this big chair on the other side and surrounded by Custer memorabilia because he had an enormous amount of it. And, um, and, and that's what he lived for. He worked really right up until he became too ill at the end to work. But retirement was never really a thought for Clive. Um, and the only reason he took on collaborators was uh, one that as he got older, we talked about this a lot, now that I'm older than Clive was when he had this idea, um, he said that he just couldn't do all the heavy lifting of the research on his own anymore, that it was it was just too hard because the books got bigger. If you look at Raise the Titanic and then you look at some of the later books, you can see how much more went into them. But the other is he just had so many ideas for stories and he felt, as we all do when we age, that he was running out of time. And he wouldn't be able to tell all those stories, and so if he brought people in to work on it with him, um, he could carry on and really love, um, you know, creating and, and being the editor, because he was a serious editor, um, and it kept him going. I mean, you know, he was productive. He died when he was 89, so he was productive, really, right up until the last few weeks. Cl Clive always had the best ideas, which... I, I think I've told this story before at one of the Custler conventions. You know, you'd go in there, you feel like you're a young hotshot, and you really want to impress this guy who's been one of your heroes, and you have this list of ideas. And uh, th this would happen all the time. I, I, you know, I, you don't go in there, uh, 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 you know, unprepared. So I have this list of ideas, and I had some backup ideas, and 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 I would. I would say, he would say, okay, let's talk about what we're going to do in the next book. And I would say, all right, what about this? And I'd say, blah, 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 blah. And he would say, okay, that's good, but uh, what else do you got? And then I would say, blah, 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 blah. And then he would say, that's really good, but I did that five books ago. And then we'll go down to like third idea and the fourth idea. And then uh, finally we'd run out of ideas. And then I'd be like, now what? And then he would usually look over and say, what if we do this? And it was usually a great idea. And it kind of used to aggravate me, to be completely honest. <laughs> because it's just like, I'm trying to come up with all these great ideas to impress him. I'm trying to really, like, you know, 
say, look how, look, look at this. I, I, this is a home run. I'm hitting this out of the park. And then he would, he would just say, what if we do this? And it really looked like he just kind of came up with it on the spot, which even made it more annoying. And then it, it, there's nothing you could do. You just sit there and you just have a weird look on your face. And like, yeah, that's a great idea. Okay. Why did you let me waste all my time with all those bad ideas? <laughs> but, you know, he, that's one of the things that he was a spectacularly creative person with great instincts. Even when we'd be trying to figure out a weird way to go in the book, you know, he would sometimes suggest things. And I remember I had a conversation with Paul Comprecos about this, said the same exact thing. Every once in a while, Clive would just suggest something to you like, well, how about it happens here? Or how about you do this? Or how about they find the ship over here? And usually you start off thinking like, well, there's no way that's going to work. But, you know, Clive's the boss. So you start looking into it and trying to figure out how it would blend with the rest of the plot that you've already kind of put together. And then you start doing some research. And I swear to you, nine out of ten times, you find some unique thing that connected exactly what Clive was suggesting, that there was no way he could have known in the first place. And it was like, that idea is perfect. And then the next thing you know, you know you're know, you moving on and, and, you, and you're finishing up the book in style. So... It, but that was that's all creativity and and just instincts for storytelling, which Clive had like nobody else. Maybe a good a good final question. Uh, have you started the next book? Yes, we have started the next Numa Files book. We are uh, we we've we've spent a lot of time um, working with Dirk Kussler. Uh, I've been working back and forth with Dirk, and. Uh, We've kind of hammered out in a, a pretty detailed outline, uh, and you know I think the plans are with the publisher now to uh, just continue on going forward. Uh, and I think one of the advantages of the situation that Clive created is that you know he spent so much time with us that it really has always felt like a family. Uh, you know I, I I would tell other people like this is the best job going in writing because not only are you working with a guy who's fantastic not only your your books you know everywhere when you're going around seeing them which is what every author really wants not only are you making a good living but you're also in this situation where you're really connecting with somebody on a personal level not just not just a work level and that was one of the things that was great about working with Clive and I think the genius of that at this particular moment is all of us who've worked with him for a long time, you know, we can hear his voice when we're still working on the next book, and, I, and I'm sure that I will. Um, so, uh, yep, we're going forward with a new one, and, and we're really excited about it. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be back here in a year doing another big event. Well, I certainly hope so. I also think it's fair to say that Clive's wife for many years, Janet, was very much involved um, with Clive, not necessarily with you guys, although maybe she was, but... Um, and she had a lot to do with his thinking yep. and so forth, and she's still available as a resource. So um, there's a lot of continuity. It, Jan no, working with Janet was fantastic. Yep. Janet and Clive were kind of an inseparable team in terms of how they, uh, you know, saw the world and did things. And uh, like I said, she was a big part of what made it feel like a family. Every time we would come into town, you know, they would host us, and it would be more like getting together with a, you know, long lost friends as opposed to a business meeting. And Clive and Janet both had that gift to be able to make you feel like that. And, th and that was that was one of the best things about, you know, being in this situation, getting this opportunity. I miss him in the parking lot. Clive Houston, you know, he has these fabulous cars. And Clive used to roar up to sign, you know, zillions of books in our back room. And um, and we all would see him, you know, pull up in whatever wonderful car it was and park it out there, and then people would collect. And, um, and you know, we really miss him. It's almost like he's a ghost here at the store. There are many times when I go into the back room and I sort of think I see him for a minute. That's fantastic. I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe. He, I wouldn't be surprised if he, if, he, if he comes around and checks on you every once in a while. It's a long time to be together. It was a real wrench to lose him. But how lucky we are that he actually had the foresight to put 
all of this in place so that you readers don't really have to lose Cussler stories, even if we've lost Clive. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We apologize again for the little glitch there in Facebook, which we can stitch together um, and put back up. So, um, And there will be a podcast of this event, which you can listen to. And Graham, what a treat to have you here. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you, um, this isn't a Zoom event. We've done so many of them seeing an actual live author. is like, It's just amazing. So it's, 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 it's a strange thing to be traveling and actually seeing people in person. It's, it's, but it's awesome. It's great. It's wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. Good Thank night, you. everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.